All right, thank you everyone for joining uh, with us on a weekday evening. And thank you so much for volunteering at the Snow Goose Festival over the weekend. Um, without any delays, uh, we'll get started. We will have three sections. Uh, Jeff here will talk about uh, general, um, general information and then information specific to the tourists leaving from Tillfield Arena. And then I will explain about the Nature Alberta tours that are leaving from Edmonton and coming back to Edmonton. Uh, two different tours, and then Jaina will uh, talk about the three-hour hikes that are leaving from Beaver Hill Birds Observatory, or leave, leaving from Tofield Arena to Beaver Hill Birds Observatory. Again, another different tour. So three different tours. The three of us will be going over doors uh, one after the other. And then if you have questions, you can ask once uh, our sessions are done. Uh, and Jeff, you can get started. Okay, great. I'll just um, do a screen share here. Okay, and there, phew. Doesn't always work first time, so that's good. Uh, well, thanks, Kathu, and uh, welcome everyone. This won't take too long, so those of you that are Oilers fans, uh, will be finished before the game starts. And if you're a Toronto fan, I'm afraid I don't know the score. So fingers crossed that Toronto continues to do well. Uh, so the idea is in the next few minutes, we'll give you a, a brief orientation to uh, the Snow Goose Festival and your, your role as guides. We'd first like to thank you very, very much for volunteering your time, sharing your enthusiasm and knowledge of birds and all wildlife uh, with others, the people that will be on the buses or on the hikes with you. And I would say that you'll never know the impact that you could have on participants in enriching their lives. I've had uh, several heartwarming stories how people had never realized that there were birds so interesting, that nature was so interesting. Um, one couple had become dead keen botanists as a result of going out on a snow goose festival guy uh, trip. Uh, so you have a potentially a huge impact on on people and those that are already keen, you're just reinforcing their enjoyment and uh, meeting new friends. So thank you very much. As Kathu said, there's three categories of tour guides, and this was a bit confusing last night. So we'll just repeat sort of what Kathu just said. Uh, the first are the guides that are on buses leaving from the Tofield Arena on two to three hour tours. And they're coordinated out of tow field and i'll be there um, throughout the two days there are tours leaving from edmonton there's three buses a day and leaving from three different locations and they were coordinated by nethu and nature alberta and nethu will talk about it after me and then there are hikes in the natural area they leave from the tow field arena in a short shuttle bus uh, out to the natural area and then Jaina and you uh, volunteers will lead you on a three-hour hike there. It's, or not lead you, you will be the guides for a three-hour hike, meeting the buses at the natural area, visiting the bird observatory, and then getting back to the buses to shuttle back to the arena. So the first um, set of comments apply to the first category here, the Tofield Arena, but I'll also talk a bit about the birds. So if you're on one of the last two categories, uh, it's good to write down the name of the, the tour that you're on and the bus. And if you're sharing guiding with another person and you're like me, you forget names easily, it's also good to um, write the, the name of your co-guide down so that you have that. Uh, at the arena, uh, try and arrive uh, up to 30 minutes early if you can. Uh, once you get in the arena, you'll quickly get distracted with the many displays there. Check in with Jim Lang. He will be at the registration desk, uh, the guide registration desk, which is right behind the uh, uh, tour registration for the public. And he will be getting updates from the guides that are out scouting for us. And I, I, my job will be to relay the scouts information about the geese and where they are to Jim, who will then put them on a map and give them to you. And then you should go out, uh, check your bus, meet your driver, introduce yourself, store your gear in the front seat. 
so that you've got good access to view wildlife as you're driving and easy access to your driver to give him directions, especially if it starts to change. I understand we've asked that, it, that drivers, if possible, be repeat drivers from last year. So they have some familiarity with Beaver County and the lay of the land. So that should make um, uh, navigating easier. And greet with two E's uh, your passengers at the east entrance to the arena. Um, introduce yourself and guide people onto the bus, make sure they're getting onto the, the right bus. And then on the bus, introduce yourself and have your helper, your assistant introduce themselves. So there's lots more instructions on that first page. Um, you can read that at your leisure, but I think those, those are the um, most important. Uh, guide your driver as you go. Uh, you're keeping track of the road signs and helping him or her. Uh, and then stop for any interesting sightings. Although you're going to have a goal of getting to certain locations where there are uh, hopefully large flocks of geese, if you see a bluebird or a red-tailed hawk or whatever, uh, stop and, and show everyone on the bus, uh, explain what you've seen, uh, make it light and fun. Hopefully, um, if you're uh, good at cracking jokes, then hopefully people will laugh at them. And if you're not good at cracking jokes like me, they'll laugh at, uh, they laugh at me. So uh, either way, people have fun. And monitor your return time. So an ideal way to do that is with Google Maps. If you set Google Maps and put your destination to be the arena, then Google Maps will track how long it will take you get to get back to the arena, the best route, and your arrival time at the arena. So you need to make a note of what time your bus is expected back. Are you a two-hour trip or a three-hour trip? what time are you expected, and then track Google Maps to um, when it tells you that your arrival time back at the arena will be what you need to be, then uh, turn your bus around and, and uh, act accordingly. Uh, there's a checklist of birds. You're welcome to keep that active. If there's someone keen on your bus, you could give them a checklist and they can, and then at the end of the trip, you can relay uh, how many species of birds you've uh, seen. Um, and uh, but I would ignore number 81 on the list. I think that was put there. Uh, this list dates back to 1991 and the joke's still there. So um, hopefully you won't see too many number 81s. How to get to Tofield is pretty easy. You head out on Highway 14 uh, to the signs that direct you into Tofield. Uh, again, if you've got Google Maps, just Google Tofield Arena and you'll find the festival headquarters there. Give yourself lots of time. It's usually by the time you get going out of Edmonton, it's a good hour to get out of Edmonton and then negotiate the parking lot at the arena. So give yourself lots of time. You shouldn't really need this map. You will be given maps by Jim Lang. Um, they're going to be laminated maps. So we like to get them back for uh, the following buses. Um, so the just some a bit of biology, the latest estimate is there are 15 million snow geese in North America and they're all headed north right now. So they're not all coming through Beaver County, uh, but there's certainly been lots over the last two weeks. Uh, Gerald Romanchuk, who I see is on the call, has organized some guides. The guides are so keen, they've been tracking the geese for two weeks, even though the records from two weeks ago don't work anymore. It's still, um, they're very keen to find out where they are for us. The high, large, large number of geese, the population explosion, is at least in part due to high overwinter survival. So there was a population explosion uh, due to rice growing in the US. So agriculture on the Gulf Coast, uh, parts of Mexico and California changed and rice was grown a lot. That leaves a lot of spilled rice in the fields and the geese harvest that through the winter. So they have been, um, have very low overwinter mortality, high survival. Uh, they produce okay. more eggs or more success, successful in the summer. Sorry, or, someone needs to mute themselves if possible, please. Um, and just so you're aware, there is a spring hunt of snow geese. This has been encouraged by the US and Canadian Fish and Wildlife Service to try and control the number of geese, reduce their numbers. The problem is that not that there's we don't like lots of geese. The problem is when they get to their breeding grounds in the Arctic, they're overgrazing the 
um, nesting areas, the nesting colonies. They not only eat all the vegetation, but they pull out the roots and the tubers and leave behind a mud flap. So the hope is that the number of geese can be reduced to try and reduce that damage. However, I don't think it's working because in 1991, the estimate was 10 million snow geese. So um, the spring hunt does keep, give folks a chance to get some fresh um, meat. And I know it's particularly important for indigenous peoples to be able to get that spring food. So the lesser snow geese that are coming through Beaver Hill area in central Alberta, uh, winter in Mexico, in uh, Texas and the adjacent states. I think some are a bit further south than that map shows. You'll see on a subsequent map. And then some are in uh, California adjacent areas. The ones from California across the Rockies, some go up the West Coast, but a lot cross the Rockies, come through the Great Plains where we've got lots of uh, forage for them to eat and refuel. Uh, they mix in Alberta and Saskatchewan, and then they split up again. And the bulk of the birds that are coming through here are headed to either Banks Island or Wrangell Island off the coast of uh, Russia. And a, an interesting side note here is the, um, they don't breed until they're two years old. So in their second winter, they need to find a mate. And yet they're all mixing in the wintering areas. So you end up with a, for example, a female from Wrangell Island um, thinking some male from Banks Island is pretty cute. They form a pair in the winter, they head north and they go to where the female came from. So they will go back to Wrangell Island. He will follow her to her uh, natal colony. So there's good mixing of the population as a result. The, I don't have that, I couldn't find the graph. Uh, the wave of geese that are coming through at the start of the migration are the adults, ones that are two years and older, and they're in a rush to get north. They want to get going, lay their eggs, uh, have their young and uh, molt. So they have to get all that done before winter arrives. Whereas the one-year-olds can lollygag, take their time feeding, all they have to do is go up north, molt, and fly back south again. They don't have to do the whole breeding thing. So the uh, migration gets quite extended. If some people are worried they're maybe not around, these uh, geese will be around through the end of, um, well, some will be around even at the end of May. So there's lots of birds to uh, still come north. Oops, sorry. Um, I won't try and go into the identification of all the different geese. And I had a fellow on the call last night who said he would work with me and come up with a better uh, guidebook than, than this 1991 version. So um, hopefully both all of you have good bird books. You have Merlin or one of the identification apps on your phone so that you can uh, double check if you are concerned about what geese, but all the geese on the chart there are all uh, possible. Some like the emperor goose are not very likely, but one can always hope and dream. Uh, one easy one to separate, moderately easy one to separate out is the snow goose from a Ross goose. So the Ross's goose has a much shorter bill. It's a smaller bird, a daintier bird, and the bill is, is noticeably smaller. The other note is that snow geese come in two color phases. So there is a blue goose, which looks much darker than the, um, than the snow geese. So don't be fooled if there's some darker goose there and they don't line up um, to be one of the other darker geese. Uh, I'm not gonna talk a lot about Beaver Hill Lake. Most of you won't be going there except those that are guiding in the natural area, but it is renowned as a staging area for migrating waterfowl. And that's partly due to all the agriculture in Beaver County as much as it is the uh, lake body itself. At the Bird Observatory, we recorded uh, over 250 species of birds in the area, and uh, over 100 species are known to breed. Uh, it's a national nature viewpoint. It's a Ramsar wetland, waterfowl wetland area. It's a Western Hemispheric Shorebird Reserve uh, network site too. So it's it's got lots of important designations on it. And that just reminded me, the uh, people today had take pictures of ibis at the weir. So ibis are back, watch for those as you're driving by any of the wetlands um, uh, on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, the top part of this doesn't apply, so that's where we get into needing to revise it. There are no bait stations on the south end of the lake. 
and they haven't been operational for more than a decade. So that's where we need to update this. The code of ethics, um, it's always good to remind oneself and it's reprinted in the middle page of the festival newsletter that has been distributed. And if you haven't got one yet, there'll be some of the arena for you to uh, take home. Uh, Beaver Hill Lake, I've already talked about. There might be some shorebirds around. I haven't heard of a lot yet, but uh, Gerald and others may have uh, seen the first influx of shorebirds. Uh, the status you can read yourself. I've already told you there's 15 million snow geese, so there's lots to uh, come north. Um, one of the pluses in snow geese is in comparison to many other birds, and this is a graph from a paper that was published in, in 2020, we've lost about one third of the birds in North America. They simply have vanished, died, uh, populations have crashed. The good news for waterfowl is they've actually increased over that time frame, So they've increased by 50%, which is obviously um, a, a, been a benefit of Ducks Unlimited, the North American Waterfowl Management Plan that is focused on uh, retaining and recreating wetlands. Uh, birds of prey have recovered from DDT and the pesticide problems that they've had. Uh, there's a bunch of birds in the middle there that are going up and down the smaller percentages. And then, of course, there's those that are crashing, the shorebirds, the grassland birds, and the aerial insectivores. And we've now got new generations of insecticides that are harming the insect populations that those um, birds at the bottom are dependent upon. So. Um, not a good news. I'll be highlighting some of that in my talk at the banquet. So if you're going to the banquet, I'll be talking about uh, swallows as the 21st century canary in a cold mine. So yeah, I think you'll find that a, a fun talk. Uh, more about geese in the manual there. If you can read on your own. The map is interesting here. This map, um, which is getting to be a poor Xerox of a Xerox, does show the wintering area much further south on the Texas Gulf Coast, even into Louisiana. And it shows some of the birds that come through here and into, I guess, into Manitoba actually end up on the uh, Hudson's Bay shore and not just the pure high Arctic. So there, there's a lot of mixing of the geese from wintering areas crossing over, but they're crossing over in the Great Plains, especially Alberta and Saskatchewan, before they head to their Arctic uh, nesting sites. So thank you again for donating your time and your enthusiasm. The public will greatly uh, appreciate it. Uh, not all geese line up like this. They were told to line up before they entered the flyway, um, but obviously just for fun, they're actually, the geese are feeding on hay that was laid out for these cows. A bale was unrolled and the, and the cows have finished eating and the geese are taking advantage of it. They normally don't occur in, nice straight lines like this. So thank you again. Thank you, Jeff. Um, if no one has any questions or if you wanna wait till the end of all three sessions, we can wait till then. If if no questions, I can start the, uh, start to share information about the Nature Alberta tours. Okay, so I, I have a question now, just to clarify, because at the start, there were three different volunteers. So um, which one am I? Am mm -hmm. I? You're with Nature I, Alberta. Is nature, I'm Nature Alberta. Yes. So this is the part that's relevant to me. Yes. So it doesn't matter if I didn't understand the previous one. Um. Yes, well, I know Jeff shared a lot of um, informa general information about the birds, waterfalls, wildlife, and snow geese. So, um, but the specific information about specific tours, um, that's okay. This is different. So, this okay. is your session. Yes, maybe. Okay. Sounds good? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that question. So, yeah, for Nature Alberta buses, we have three buses leaving on Saturday and three buses leaving on Sunday. They're all de departing Edmonton from three different locations at three different times. And I have introduced our volunteer tour guides and volunteer tour bus assistants to the coordinators from the partnering organizations who will also be on the bus. Uh, so all three of you know each other already virtually through emails. Um, and then 
uh, and then I'm going to take one of these buses as an example and talk more about the, uh, go more into the tour details. So Nature Albeda Tours will have two roles. Tour guides will basically interpret uh, birds or nature when they're out in the field or while on the bus and tour assistants will help keep a head count and make sure everyone's back on the bus, the herd participants back to the bus and also keep track of time. Uh, so this is, as I said before, this is just a template. I took the Sunday, one of the Sunday buses leaving from uh, Freshco Coliseum. So there are three different locations for Sunday at three different times and I'm taking this as an example. Uh, so this one leaves at 10 o'clock in the morning and all of you have different times leaving and you know your time. So it is recommended to arrive at least 15 minutes prior to the departing time because the buses are set to move right at this time. Um, the buses will leave Edmonton at the given time. And then you, when once you arrive at the Strathcona Wilderness Center, you we have allocated one hour to spend there. Uh, and then you arrive at the after the Strathcona Wilderness Center, the next stop is the uh, trade show arena where you will also spend one hour and then you will go out to the snow goose chase uh, which will be two hours and then once the snow goose chase is done you will come back to the ar arena stop for another half an hour and then from there you will leave directly to the to Edmonton uh, so one you will remain in the same bus uh, until you come back the bus that you, and then it'll come back to the same location that it departed from. So all the volunteers, volunteer assistants will remain in the same bus throughout the field trip. Uh, now, while on the bus, uh, you can uh, engage participants in nature kids games or interpret nature or birds. Or if there's an exciting wildlife sighting, you can talk about that or answer general questions from the participants. We, I also, uh, Last week, I dropped off the Beaver Hill Biosphere booklets, or I think just this week, Monday, I dropped off the Beaver Hill Biosphere booklets with our partnering organizations, and they have one copy each for our tour guides and tour bus assistants. So the participants will have a booklet, you will have a booklet, you can talk about that, you can uh, go through the book together with them while on the bus as well. Uh, with them, I also dropped off uh, name tags. So while on the bus, you can collect your name tags. I have one each for the tour guide and tour bus assistant. Uh, and then you can wear it um, throughout the trip. Uh, then at Strathcona Wilderness Center, uh, I know some of you joined us last year as well. Um, last year, you had to do the guided walk by yourself. But this year, we have requested staff uh, to do the interpretive nature walk so you can simply enjoy the nature walk at Strathcona Wilderness Center. They may divide you into two different groups. In that case, we ask the tour guide to join one group and the tour bus assistant to join the other group and still enjoy the nature walk. The only thing you have to do at the Strathcona Wilderness Center is make sure that you keep track of time. Once you hit the 40 to 45 minute mark, you can let the staff know who's guiding the nature walk. It's time for you to wrap up the walk and head back to the bus. So as I told you before, we allocated one hour here. The two, nature walk will be only 40 or 45 minutes and the remaining 15 minutes will be for participants to get back to the bus or to use washroom breaks uh, as necessary at the Strathcona Wilderness Center. So from there, you will head directly to the Toefield Arena. Uh, most important thing there, <laughs> collect the brown bag lunches. There will be both uh, vegetarian options and turkey options, turkey sandwich options as well. So depending on your dietary restrictions, you will have a choice there. Uh, and then uh, you can visit the Nature Alberta booth because we will have uh, two spotting scopes and a few binoculars available. If tour guides or tour bus assistants would like to take it on the bus with them, set it up outside when you uh, stop to stop during the snow goose chase uh, and help participants manage, uh, share them while in the bus. So if you take a few binoculars, you would have to make sure that you manage it uh, among the participants who want to share it. Uh, that's there, you're welcome to borrow it. Um, we only have two spotting scopes though. We will have three buses. So depending on who has the most need or who comes first, spotting scopes might be gone, but we, we should have more binoculars with us. And um, another important thing, while at the Toefield Arena, you have to collect the map uh, from the registration desk. 
with that, Jeff mentioned about a cap. So I'll let him talk about that at the end. There's something else that you get collect with the map, uh, especially for the volunteers. So collect the map and you can hand it out to the, you can give it to the bus driver. We have requested the same bus drivers who joined our Edmonton buses last time. So hopefully if they're able to join, they would have a better understanding of the route that we're gonna go as well. Uh, and then, uh, when you finish exploring the Tofield Arena, finished having lunch, uh, after one hour's time, you can get everyone back to the buses and head out to the field. So um, the buses will stop according to the map uh, where the most number of geese are. So when you make a stop, you can set up spotting scopes if you borrowed one from us or if you have one and guide participants again to uh, where what birds they are or interpret nature, in, interpret birds or interpret other wildlife as you see them. Um, so out in the field to a bus assistance, again, has that important task of making sure everyone's back in the bus, back on the bus, keeping a head count, uh, and then assisting to a guide uh, with any tasks that's needed. So after spending two hours out in the field, looking at snow gaze, you will be back at the arena. So if you borrowed any of the spotting scopes or binoculars, you can bring it back to the Nature Opera booth. We will have a signing sheet. So when you take it, you will put a sign and then when you bring it back, you'll we'll check it off. And, uh, and then uh, the, this, this last stop at the arena is mainly to for washroom breaks. If participants want to take washroom breaks before heading back to Edmonton. So once again, do a head count, make sure all the participants are back on the bus and then uh, then you will be heading back to Edmonton. So uh, I know I have some of their, uh, some of the representatives from the partnering organizations joining us tonight as well. You know your participants, so when you want, when you have to keep track of time, you can tell them like we have to get we have to go now. We have to keep uh, to follow the schedule, so you can do that. You can do that as well. You can help our volunteers keep track of time and make sure everyone's back on the bus. Keep the numbers, uh, keep a head count on the. Make sure the numbers are right. You can help the volunteers with that as well. So that's sort of everything I have for the Nature Alberta volunteers. You can let me know if you have any questions now, or we can wait till Jenna's session is done as well. Do we have any questions right now? I think we're good for now, Jenna. All right, can you see my slide? Yes. Perfect. There we go. Perfect. All right, it wasn't popping up on mine, so. Um, all right, so uh, one thing to pay attention to when you arrive at the uh, arena is your bus number. So you each in your volunteer sign up thing have a bus number. So just make sure you get on the right bus. Um, most of them are just one person. Uh, you're welcome to bring a friend if you would like, but it's just one person on the bus um, that's assigned to the tour guide right now. But uh, the bus will take you down what we call Rowan's route to uh, the Beaver Hill Bird Observatory, just down a gravel road. You'll get to this um, gate here. Uh, don't be alarmed if you feel like you're going into someone's field. Um, that is the right location. So you will be driving through this gate. You might have to help the, the bus driver um, get out, open the gate, let them drive through and then close the gate behind them. And um, you may, shouldn't, oh, sorry, there's the gate. You should not see cows in there. They shouldn't be in there, but just in case, make sure all gates are closed behind you. Uh, you'll drive out to the um, volunteer parking lot, get off the bus there, and then there's signage there. Um, just go past the sign up to um, Harrier Highway is what it's called. There's a good lookout on the way there. Feel free to stop there and see if you see any fun birds. Do some birding along the way. Point out anything that you see or hear, um, birds or any other wildlife as well. Apparently, there is a rough grouse hanging out on Warbler Way. So say hi to Oscar um, if you see him. Uh, so if you take a left on Warbler Way, that'll take you to the observatory. There is signage along the way, so it's pretty easy to navigate to. And you'll be at the observatory for a little bit. We'll do some batting demonstrations. Hopefully be catching lots of birds. Um, if captures are low, we'll take you out to the lakeside and um, 
talk about our purple martins and our tree swallows and our lake and all that stuff but we'll try to fill the time um but we're predicting it'll be pretty busy all the birds are really early this year uh, keep an eye on the time make sure that you give yourself a good half an hour to get back to the bus um, you'll do that via weasel wind and we can direct you if you're confused i think most of you have been out to the observatory before so you should be good hang a left onto bbo boulevard Ooh, why are you going the wrong way hang a left on bbo boulevard you'll come up to our volunteer parking lot and then hang a left down uh Exciter alley and that'll take you right back to the parking lot um but yeah this this tour is pretty easy it's um, not necessarily to view the huge flocks of snow geese. You may see some um, at the volunteer parking lot out in the lake, but um, this is more for a, a guided nature hike and um, out to the BBO and kind of enjoy what we get to do every day. So uh, let me know if you have any questions. Um, thank you, Dana. I uh, I think we have a question for you, Dana. Uh, how do we know of a bus number and doing the hike tour? We have a question regarding that. Sure. So the bus thing? number, the bus number, like the buses will have a card on them that with the number on it. And then the number that you're assigned to is in your volunteer sign up. Okay. So if you're confused what number you are, feel free to email me and I can let you know what number it is. And then you said there's a question about the guide on. Um, okay, I see. Mm -hmm. There's a question about when does the last public transit bus depart Cofield to Sherwood Park? Let me look at the Snowbus Festival website real sure. quick. Yeah, yeah, that I don't know offhand, but it's also printed in the newspaper supplement that you can pick up at the registration desk. Um, yes, uh, Juliana, if you're parking or if you're doing the, um, the hikes, uh, you can park at the Tollfield Arena. Um, don't park at BBO because you will need to get back to Tollfield to get on the bus. Right. And the bus will bring you back to Tollfield so you can get yes. back to your car. Yeah. It's a round trip to and from the, um, arena. Oh, and at the arena, I forgot to mention, there will have a booth there that, um, you can come and see our education birds so hopefully we'll have our burrowing owl and our red tail talk there and then at the observatory we'll have our great horned owl so you're guaranteed to see some cool birds uh so the last bus from sherwood park will be departing at 6 30 both saturday and sunday great and then there's a, a note from uh pearl ann about um Emmanuel, that you're on the call, Emmanuel, but you haven't signed up yet. So what we request you do is go to www.snowgoosefestival.ca backslash volunteer, and you can see where we still need volunteers. You can look at your personal schedule and what fits in and then pick a, um, a bus tour. That's more strictly for the buses leaving from Tofield and doing a two and three hour um, uh, trip. So the other guiding uh, bookings are pretty full, but we do still need some more uh, for the guides leaving. And if you're not totally confident of your birds, then look where someone has already signed up and, and signed up to be an assistant, and that would be very helpful. And you'll also learn lots of birds from, from the guide that's already signed up. Um, Jay, to answer your question, uh, we haven't um, set the nets up yet. That'll be we're opening for the season on Saturday. So we'll, we'll be catching our first bird Saturday morning. Jeff, so I, a also question. Put the, I also put the link to the volunteer uh, volunteer link on the chat. So if anyone wants, they can directly go from there. Great. Thank you. And Steve asked what's causing the shorebird decline while waterfowl and geese are increasing. It's a difference in the habitat. So the waterfowl and geese are able to feed on ponds, they're eating vegetation. The shorebirds are feeding on uh, invertebrates and mudflats. So if one thinks of the mudflats like at Beaver Hill Lake, the water that comes from Beaver Hill Lake comes down off agricultural fields, Amos Creek, and flows into the lake. And flowing in that uh, water that comes off the fields are nicanoids. 
So, um, well, I've just forgotten her name now. Well, that's embarrassing. At the University of Saskatchewan, she's done intensive research on neonicotinoids that are put on all our crops on the seeds to stop insects eating the seeds. And the highest levels of neonicotinoids in ponds adjacent to fields are in the spring when the snow melt is washing the water into the ponds. The neonicotinoids are still active and they're killing the invertebrates in the ponds on the mud flats. Um, and that causes problems, obviously, for shorebirds and putting on weight when they're doing their long distance migrations.